couple of videos back we were entering into a deeper level of realization and then in the last video we were back within the entrapment of our mind and this is the way it goes enlightenment practice there may be such a thing as enlightenment but it seems to me that a more accurate picture is to talk in terms of enlightenment practice enlightenment's a dynamic state it's something which needs to be constantly worked at it's something that is constantly returned to it's not something you arrive at and end of story it's not the way consciousness works consciousness comes and goes awareness comes and goes enlightenment comes and goes I may be wrong in this but I can only talk from my own experience here not from ideas I've got about these teachings so it doesn't really make any sense to talk about being enlightened we can talk about being enlightenment practitioners anyway I've covered this in the past and as I said the, the last few verses are when we are back in our ordinary limited consciousness and we're practicing we're practicing to come back to consciousness this is enlightenment practice so we have to know when we're not aware we have to be able to discriminate the fact that we're in a limited state of mind and we're no longer back in awareness so that's what so that's what the last few verses were concerned with they're concerned with the limited state and bringing awareness to this limited state which is usually referred to as ignorance or samsara and the next few verses continue with this shining a light on our our state of ignorance verse 495 because of the combination of appearances and seeds there are the twelve ayatanas because of the combination of subject and object I talk of doings so there's stuff going on there's stuff going on and we discriminate aspects of that stuff we identify aspects of that stuff which are somehow which we somehow regard as important and we regard them as important in accordance with our psychological disposition these are the seeds these are the this is the appearance the visual is a visual appearance but there's also feelings and the other senses so we we tune into them in accordance so we tune into these appearances in accordance with our disposition, our psychological disposition, our samskaras. Samskara is the word that's usually used. And this becomes the reality that we inhabit. And it's a reality which we assume is based on the idea of an external world which we are experiencing through the senses and this is what's meant by the ayatanas the ayatanas are the six senses plus the objects of the senses there are six because the mind is also regarded as a sense the mind is what perceives mental objects which is quite important actually I'll probably say more about that at a later date. So this is the story we inhabit. We inhabit this world 
which we're experiencing through the senses. So there's a me here, a subject here, experiencing objects here. And this is a combination of subject and object which is referred to. And because of this, the Buddha talks of doings. He talks about the idea that you can do things in order to become more effective as a human being. So we inhabit this story of an external world that we're experiencing through the senses. And it's a tricky one to undermine. I don't think many teachers talk about this actually because surely that's the situation there's a world there which we experience through the senses well it's a situation I've explored in detail in the past in many videos and to get a, a feel for the invalidity of this particular understanding I usually, I usually refer to the phenomenon, the phenomenon of dreams. In the dream, the dream you is wandering around an external world, seeing things, smelling things and all the rest of it, feeling things, feeling embarrassed or whatever, feeling afraid, feeling intoxicated. So you've got it all going on in a dream. But are you experiencing dream objects through your dream senses? It makes no sense to, to say so. It's all simply happening. So you might say, well, yes, that's a dream. But when you're awake, it's different. Well, I began by giving the example of dream just as an analogy to get a feel for the possibility that perhaps the story of an external world and our sensory perception of it is a story, it's a fabrication. But when you think about it a little bit more, or when you consider it in a bit more detail, or when you examine it directly, you understand, well, this is actually how consciousness operates. The dream phenomenon is given as an example of how consciousness operates. And given that we can't really differentiate metaphysically or philosophically between the waking state and the dream state, I mean, the waking state is also consciousness and operation. This is how consciousness operates. It externalizes itself and then loses itself in that externalization. I mentioned dreams, but the same thing happens when we're watching a drama, a film, a movie, a theater production, or even just listening to somebody else tell a story. We enter into it. We do this with our own thoughts, our own daydreams. We enter into them. We lose ourselves in them. And we come back out of it eventually. But this is consciousness coming and going all the time. And in this so-called waking state, consciousness is doing the same thing. It's externalizing itself. And as enlightenment practitioners, we see this, and then, and in seeing it, we come back to consciousness itself. So this is a very subtle teaching, and it's possibly one that most people are not going to be able to go with. And the Buddha being the Buddha, he still wants to give people something. So he'll give them practices, practices to help them steady the mind and to live life.
to live lives with clear consciences. So we'll continue with the next verse in the next video.